in case you're wondering, it's because I like it, because I wanted to, and because it's my YouTube channel. So with that out of the way, uh, this is the last of these lessons that we'll be getting, and uh, I'm going to be getting into some strange stuff today in regards to this subject on the spirit and power of Elijah. And uh, this lesson will probably be a little bit longer than usual. I figured it'd be better to go ahead and just do this whole lesson in one shot rather than do it in two parts. And also, I'm having to pre-record this lesson this time, and I'm not going to have a lesson next week, but I'll pick it back up the following week. So uh, these are live streaming to YouTube and Sermon Audio, and I think also Facebook, they're showing up there too. And uh, I hear my Bible studies and sermons on Final Fight Bible Radio every Friday at 8 o'clock a.m. and 8 o'clock p.m. You can check that out, download the free app. And if you enjoy this content, share these lessons with your friends and family. And uh, all of my recorded material is now on Sermon Audio. You can find the entire inventory, uh, well not inventory, but the entire uh, set of video sermons there. And also, if you are interested in additional in-depth studies, I have three books available on Final Fight Bible Radio. You can check those out. So this is part five of these lessons on the spirit and power of Elijah. And throughout these lessons, I've made it a point to emphasize that the only individuals in the Bible who had physics-defying, reality-bending, uh, miraculous powers were Moses, who transferred that power to Joshua, Elijah, who transferred that power to Elisha, and Jesus, who transferred that power to the apostles. Jesus, Elisha, and the apostles inherited their power from Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, and uh, those powers and signs and wonders cease after one transfer, as we've seen in the Bible. Joshua never transferred his power to anybody after him. Elisha never transferred the mantle, you know, if you will, to anybody that came after him. And the apostles never transferred their power to anybody after them, as we've gone, <clears throat> as we've gone through in previous lessons. Now, this power that these men had remained on them even into the grave, literally. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13, we'll start there. Like I said, I'm going to try to be uh, mindful of the length of this lesson, so we'll go kind of quickly through some of these. But <clears throat> these men took their power with them to the grave, literally. 2 Kings 13 verse 20, you have this strange story where it says, and it came to pass uh, as they, let's see, no, 2 Kings, I'm in 1 Kings. 2 Kings 13, 20, let's try it again. <clears throat> and Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass, as they were burying a man, that, behold, they spied a band of men. And these are the two guys that are burying their friend, evidently, and they see the Moabites coming. And they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet <laughs> for simply touching the bones of Elisha. Can you imagine that? I mean, those guys were burying that dead body, you know, and they see the enemies coming, those enemies' co uh, soldiers coming, they're like, oh, we got to get out of here, you know, and so they throw the, throw the corpse down in the sepulcher of Elisha, and uh, he ends up touching him and comes back to life, and those guys that are burying them, you know, they're running away from the soldiers, and then they hear someone behind them saying, hey, wait for me, and they look behind him, and there's this dead guy <laughs> chasing after him, like, hey, Wait for me. So a uh, uh, crazy story, but uh, it's right there in the Bible. Uh, the Bible said it, and I believe it, and uh, the Bible said it, and that settles it. So anyway, uh, the power was still on Elisha even after death. And uh, given this story, I don't personally see why anybody would waste their time looking for the fountain of youth or the holy grail, because when you think about it, uh, why not just search for the bones of Elisha? Right? If you're a Bible believer, I mean, if, if I was interested in finding that, those kind of things. That's what I'd be looking for, is the bones of Elisha. But anyway, this uh, story also, interestingly enough, can also provide some evidence that the Shroud of Turin, which is supposed to be the burial garments of Jesus, uh, it could be used to support the argument that the Shroud of Turin is fake. And if someone did have the burial garments of Jesus, it's plausible that someone could potentially be healed by those garments. After all, the woman who touched the garment of Jesus was healed of her plague. You remember that, her issue of blood. And uh, also, people were healed from handkerchiefs that came from the Apostle Paul, according to Acts 19, verse 12. These are just 
uh, samplings of the godlike power that was on these men. And uh, so, you know, it's interesting to think about if, you know, if, if somebody was able to find one of those garments, would it still have the healing power and all that? It's an interesting concept, you know, uh, especially when you think about that hang handkerchief of Paul. You know, were people continuing to pass that thing around? Uh, did somebody keep that for themselves and then give it to their friends, give it to their friends? I mean, it kind of makes you wonder. Um, if one was ever discovered in an excavation in Israel, would it still heal people? You know, like I said, it's kind of interesting to think about. I'm sure nothing like that is in existence. I seriously doubt. And uh, given, at least any more, you know, obviously it, those things would be lost to time. But uh, given human nature, people would end up revering those things as sacred objects, and uh, which is obviously not what God would want. But nevertheless, uh, like I said, it's an interesting thing to consider. Uh, but it's a moot point either way, I think. Now, uh, the story uh, of Elisha still having power after death indicates that the power that these men, uh, the power that they had, remains with them even after they die, which truthfully is consistent with Romans 11.29, which says the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, right? So God doesn't take back the gifts of the Spirit that he gives to people even after they die, apparently, okay? But uh, this is further substantiated by the two witnesses over in Revelation 11. And uh, this lesson we're going to get into some end times prophecy stuff that you might find interesting. But in Revelation chapter 11, in verses 3 through 6, we read this, And I will give power unto my two witnesses. This is future post-church rapture in the end times. I will give my power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, that's three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Okay, so that tells you right there that these two guys are not two average people on the planet. These are two people that were up in heaven standing before the God of the earth. That really limits your, the criteria as to who those people could even be. All right, and it says, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this ma manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues, as often as they will. All right, so the miracles that are mentioned are miracles that are clearly connected with Moses and Elijah. And as I taught last week, given that Jesus and John the Baptist were not able to completely fulfill their missions and completely fulfill the roles of Moses and Elijah due to the Jews' unbelief, uh, Deuteronomy 18 and Malachi 4 will have to be fulfilled completely later on with the literal return of Moses and Elijah. We wouldn't have all this stuff in Revelation 11 because uh, it would not be necessary had the Jews received Jesus and John the Baptist 2,000 years ago. But since they didn't, now we have this scenario and Moses and Elijah are literally coming back. All right, so the takeaway from this, though, that I want to really kind of draw your attention to is that Moses and Elijah maintained their power. Uh, Moses and Elijah show up in the future, in the last days, and they still have the power that they had to, uh, well, 4,000 years ago, or however long it was, 3,500 years ago. They still have that power. They took that power with them when uh, Moses died and when Elijah was taken to heaven. They still have the same power that they had back then, which takes us to the edge of the rabbit hole, or uh, maybe more appropriately, the edge of the bottomless pit. You'll remember a couple weeks ago, I pointed out that the apostles evidently lost their power temporarily when Jesus died. Okay, so that's kind of a unique situation. Uh, Jesus gave up the ghost and the power of the Holy Spirit left with him. Okay. And after the resurrection, Jesus commanded the disciples, Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high, which, as we know, uh, came back to them at the Feast of Pentecost there in Acts chapter 2. Okay, so you have an interesting situation there where those apostles did temporarily lose their power while Jesus was dead in the grave, right? Uh, but then they got it back in Acts chapter 2. So the apostles evidently lost their power when Jesus died, but there was one apostle who, uh, he died before Jesus died. Now that's kind of interesting. There was one apostle who died before Jesus died, 
And I believe he took his apostolic power with him to the grave. Look at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate the governor. Okay, so there's still a number of hours before Jesus is going to die. But in verse 3 we have this. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. All right, so Judas Iscariot dies in Matthew 27, verse 5. But Jesus doesn't die until Matthew 27, verse 50. You see that? When Jesus died, the apostles temporarily lost their power. But Judas Iscariot, Judas, Judas, there we go, he died before Jesus died. So it stands to reason that he might not have lost his power. All right, and by the way, Judas, Judas Iscariot most certainly did have apostolic power, just like all the other apostles. Um, and that's obvious because, number one, if he didn't have power, it'd be pretty obvious who the traitor was <laughs> out of the 12. I mean, it'd be the one guy that doesn't have apostolic power. I wonder who it could be. No, he obviously had apostolic power. Furthermore, Matthew chapter 10 uh, clearly says that Jesus gave power to his 12 disciples, not just 11 of them. Matthew 10 verse 1 says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And then verses 2 through 4 lists out the twelve uh, disciples include, and includes Judas Iscariot in verse 4 in the list. You say, okay, so why is that, why is that significant? Why, why does all of this even matter? Well, turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, and uh, there's something strange about Judas Iscariot. John chapter 6, verse 70, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Jesus didn't say, one of you has a devil. He said, one of you is a devil. All right? If you believe every word of your King James Bible, that, that's an interesting observation right there. If we simply believe what the Bible is saying, then the only conclusion that we can come to is that Judas wasn't exactly human. We're not told how this happened. We know that he had human parents, but uh, we're not told any details about Judas Iscariot's birth. So admittedly, you know, Judas is a strange character. But I don't believe that Judas Iscariot was fully human because of this statement that Jesus made here in John chapter 6, verse 70. He said, he didn't say you have a devil. If, like if Judas was just simply a guy who was demon-possessed, he could have said you have a devil. But he said, uh, one of you is a devil. Now that's interesting. Because given that he is not human, but rather a devil, this means that Judas Iscariot more than likely, by all indications, did not have a soul. Okay? Judas, had a, Judas, this person that was Judas Iscariot, had a body. And Judas likely had a human spirit with a personality, because he would have gotten that from his mother and father's human spirit. Uh, but Judas had a devil inside of him in the place of his soul. All right? And this is a whole other uh, subject for another time. But... Uh, the fact of the matter is, the bottom line is a living creature that has a body and a spirit, but no soul, is classified as a beast in the Bible. Because animals don't have souls. They have bodies, and they have spirits, but they don't have souls. And that's what classifies them as a beast, and that's what makes humans different from beasts, is that humans have a soul. But if you have a human walking around, or something that looks like a human walking around, that can talk and interact with you and looks human but doesn't have a soul, then technically, uh, as far as a taxonomy is concerned, it's not human. It's a beast. It just looks like a human. And uh, by the way, Jesus didn't say one of you is the devil. He said one of you is a 
devil. And that's an important detail that we'll look at in just a couple minutes. Uh, in John 13, 27, at the Last Supper, we read this, John 13, 27. Bear in mind, Judas wasn't possessed of Satan back when Jesus said that in John chapter 6. He said, one of you is a devil. And Judas was not full of the spirit of Satan at that time. So that's another thing you need to keep in mind. But uh, John 17, verse 27 says this. Uh, they're at the Last Supper, and then it says, And after the sop, Satan entered into him, entered into Judas Iscariot, after the sop. Okay? Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. All right, so now we have this new interesting situation where this man, this thing that looks like a human named Judas Iscariot, has two devils in him now. One is a devil, and the other is the devil, Satan. He's got two devils possessing this body now. And after this happens, Jesus then begins to use some new terminology when he's referring to Judas Iscariot. In uh, John 14, 30, and 16, 11, uh, Jesus calls Judas Iscariot the prince of this world. In uh, John 17, 12, Jesus calls Judas Iscariot the son of perdition. So there's some interesting new titles that are being applied to Judas at this time. So for what it's worth, you might say that prior to the Last Supper, Judas Iscariot could be classified as perhaps the man of sin, a devil, and after the Last Supper, when Satan enters into him, then his title changes to the son of perdition, the devil. Kind of an interesting thought. Now here's where I'm going with this. When Jesus gave the power of the Spirit to the apostles, okay, he knowingly gave that power to Judas Iscariot, the human hybrid beast devil man, whatever you want to call him. Judas ended his life before Jesus died, and so therefore, based on what we read about Moses and Elijah and Elisha, uh, based on that information, it, I would suspect that because Judas died before Jesus died, Judas took the power of the Spirit with him, which implies that Judas took that apostolic power down to hell with him when he died. Now, hell is likened to a prison throughout the Bible, and it's a prison for spiritual entities, like angels, devils, uh, souls of men. And Judas having that apostolic power down in hell is not really going to do him any good down there. But what if Judas was able to get out of hell? That's interesting. That's interesting. So when Judas died, all right, so I'm going to draw this pit here. We'll just say it's a pit. All right, I think he took that power down with him into the pit. But what if he was able to get out? What if someday, oh, I don't know, a star falls from heaven unto the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he was to open the bottomless pit. Revelation 9.1. What do you suppose might happen? I reckon that Judas would be able to come out, and he would still have that power. Interesting to think about. <clears throat> Now, as far as the chronology of the end times events goes, the opening of the bottomless pit is the fifth trumpet judgment, which happens right around the start of the Great Tribulation by all indications. It looks like trumpets number one through five all are almost, almost simultaneous. I mean, obviously they're in consecutive order because they're one, two, three, four, five, but they all happen right around the start of the Great Tribulation. I should have written this down before I started filming. All right, three and a half years. Right around this point, the three and a half year, final three and a half year point, uh, trumpets one through five, it looks like all those trumpets are pretty close together. All right, and so that bottomless pit opens up right around that time by all indications. All right, and... Uh, I don't, uh, like I said, I don't have time to go into all the details of all of that chronology in this lesson, uh, but the end times are also likened to a woman in travail. And as I've said in previous uh, lessons multiple times, I believe that the beginning of sorrows 
is going to be uh, seven years long. And the Great Trib, which I already wrote up there, but I'll write it again, is only three and a half years long for a total of ten and a half years. But what you find throughout the Bible is that uh, the end times are likened to a woman in travail. And the Bible seems to keep using this uh, one-third fraction. One-third, one-third, one-third. Or as we would say in medical terms as relating to a pregnant woman, trimesters. You know, there's three trimesters to a pregnancy, right? And uh, we know that the last trimester is three and a half years. So, therefore, the first two trimesters would each be three and a half years apiece, which would give you three and a half years, three and a half years, three and a half years. For those of you who are math geniuses, you know that three and a half years three times is ten and a half years. <laughs> Hence, uh, another argument to the ten and a half year end time theory. And uh, during that first trimester, by all indications, like I said, I say by all indications, I don't have time to prove these things right now. I cover a lot of this stuff in that book that I wrote, and you're welcome to look at that if you want. But the 144,000 are preaching during this first uh, portion of the beginning of sorrows, and then they go up at the conditional rapture. You say, what is a conditional rapture? It has to do with Matthew 25 and a number of other places about the, uh, the foolish virgins and the wise virgins. It's a conditional rapture that takes place roughly midway into the beginning of sorrows. And that's why everybody's told to watch all the time throughout Mark and Luke and Matthew. And again, I cover that information in my book if you want to check it out. Um, the second portion of three and a half years, uh, Moses and Elijah end up being the witnesses who pick up where the 144,000 left off. So the first three and a half years, the witnesses by the 144,000. The second three and a half years is Moses and Elijah. And uh, the third three and a half years, um, well, there's not really much of a witness there anymore. And I'll mention more about that in a second. But Moses and Elijah, they die right around, right around the start of the Great Tribulation. And uh, by the way, the timing of Moses and Elijah's ministry in the book that I wrote, I wrote it back in 2014, the time of the end. I had their ministry over here because that was the general consensus as to the ministry of Moses and Elijah. But I always knew something didn't quite fit with that. And uh, since then, since 2014, I figured out the details of that. And uh, I'll have more to say about that. But um, I'm going to update the first book I did. I'm going to do a second edition of The Time of the End here pretty soon. Right after I finish uh, publishing The Time of the End Book 2, which is fully written, I'm just doing some final edits and hopefully will be released shortly. All right. But anyway, the first three and a half years is the 144,000. The second three and a half years is Moses and Elijah. And the third three and a half years, the Great Tribulation, other than an angel that flies through heaven with the everlasting gospel, there's practically no witnesses in the earth other than the witness of God's plagues. And you have a situation there where there is no witness, essentially. Uh, Amos chapter 8, verse 9 is going to be fulfilled. It says this, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. And I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the morning of an only sun, and the end thereof as a bitter day. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. You see, they were, they were, God had his servants preaching here, and then it went from 144,000 down to two. They were preaching, and now there's a famine in the land. All right, Verse 12, And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. These would be the foolish virgins that were left behind. And they that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manner of Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. All right, so we have the timing of the ministry and death of Moses and Elijah. They're killed right around the time of the start of the Great Tribulation. But look what, what else happens right around the start of the Great Tribulation. The bottomless pit opens up. Okay, so seeing as all these things are kind of happening right around the same time, 
uh, it looks like what happens here is at the end of Moses and Elijah's ministry, they square off with the Antichrist and the false prophet. But let's be a little bit more specific. They square off with the Antichrist who's been healed of his deadly wound. The healing of the Antichrist's deadly wound happens right there at the start of the Great Tribulation. So the man who is classified as the man of sin at this time, the Antichrist, the man of sin, uh, after his resurrection turns into the son of perdition, or the beast, that's his classification, and that's because at that time he will be indwelt by Satan himself. At this time, the Antichrist becomes the son of perdition, Satan manifests in the flesh. And the man of sin was a normal human ruler with a soul, evidently, uh, before, but now he dies and his risen corpse is uh, animated by Satan, and so he's no longer a human per se, and falls under the category of a beast, hence the name of the Antichrist being called uh, the Beast, right? We got uh, the 666, the mark of the beast, coming in at that time, too, all right? But uh, what you might not realize is there are going to be two beasts at that time. There's two soulless in individuals animated by devils at that time. The first beast is the son of perdition, the Antichrist. The second beast is the false prophet. And guess who he is? Turn to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. All right, this is getting all kind of convoluted here, so I don't want to try to clean this up real quick. All right, so you have the son of perdition. All right, but then you have uh, another guy that's going to show up on the scene. Revelation 13, verses 1 through 3. Okay. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. All right, so what we have here... Uh, not getting into all the details, but we have the Antichrist's assassination, and then his deadly wound is healed. All right, so he evidently he dies and rises from the dead, probably just like Jesus did, all right, as a counterfeit. Verse 11, and I beheld another beast, that's beast number two, one beast, two beast. okay? Another beast uh, coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, all right? So in the past, I've always thought of this beast here and uh, that comes out of the earth. I've always thought of that beast in terms of a nation, all right? Because a lot of times in the Bible, in Daniel 7, uh, beasts are likened to nations. And so I saw this beast, you know, oh, this must be a country of some sort. It's got two horns. Maybe that represents two kings, just like the ram back in Daniel chapter 8 was a beast and it had two horns. That represented Cyrus and Darius, these kings. So I thought, well, maybe this is a nation, and these two horns are represented. And, and I've always tried to interpret this verse along those lines, but it occurred to me the other day, what if this is just simply literal, and it's a person, not a nation? And uh, that's kind of an interesting thought. Um, because the, thing, the fact of the matter is, when you read the text, a nation... The, the, what, what this beast does describes the actions of an individual, not a nation. That is to say, a nation doesn't call fire down from heaven. Uh, a nation is not giving life to an image. The, everything that this beast does, the second beast does, is describing the actions of a person that a person would do. All right? So since interpreting this beast in terms of a nation is, you know, problematic and ambiguous and really subject to just, you can't really nail down what country this would be, um, I started trying to look at this beast and interpret this second beast in terms of a person. And if you do that, this is what you get. And I beheld another beast, not a nation, an individual, a person, coming up out of the earth. Okay? A person literally coming up out of the earth because the key to open the bottomless pit has been opened. He comes up out of the earth. 
Just like the Witch of Endor, when she was talking to King Saul, said she saw gods ascending out of the earth, and she said she said an old man cometh up, speaking of the spirit of Samuel. It's almost like maybe a similar thing, as John is describing a similar thing, literally an individual, a personage, an entity, is coming up out of the earth that she calls, or that John calls a beast. All right? And it says, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spake as a dragon. Literally. Why not? This is a description of this individual that comes out of the pit. He literally has two horns on his head, and he literally has a voice that sounds reptilian. I don't have a problem with that, uh, especially weirder, when you consider that weirder things come out of the pit, according to Revelation 9. <laughs> so I don't have a problem with a guy coming out who's a beast and has two horns on his head, speaks like a dragon. That's, that's easy. Verse 12, and he... Uh, not a nation, but rather an entity, exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. So the Antichrist has power because Satan has power, and Satan himself indwells the Antichrist at that point. And the second beast, the Bible says, causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. All right, Verse 13, And he, the false prophet, the second beast, doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That's what this second beast is doing. Just so we understand, I think the second beast is the one literally coming out of the earth. And he's doing miracles, and the weird thing is, the miracle that he does is the same miracle that Elijah did. How is this individual... How is this entity that comes out of the earth, how is he able to do the same miracle that Elijah did? How is it that this evil entity has the same spirit and power of Elijah? That's interesting. Well, maybe Satan gave this power to him. You know, maybe Satan, the dragon, the spiritual entity, Satan, the uh, fallen cherub, gave this power to him, and that's how he does it. But the specific mention of Elijah's power indicates that there's something more to this than simply satanic power. Because if this was simply power from Satan, that Satan can give whoever he wants, let's say, why didn't the Baalite priests have this ability back when they were dealing with Elijah? Why... Uh, why could, couldn't they call down fire from heaven when Elijah challenged them? Maybe it's because calling down fire from heaven is something that Satan can't do through a man. Maybe Satan can't imbue this power to a man, and only God can do that. Uh, but somehow, this individual, this, this entity that comes out of the pit, somehow this being can call down fire from heaven which the Baalite priests couldn't do. Uh, somehow this being has the same godlike power that Elijah had. And honestly, I think the best explanation for this is that this second beast is the same demon that masqueraded as Judas Iscariot 2,000 years ago. Judas Iscariot is the false prophet. The Bible oddly states in Acts 1.25 that when Judas died, he went to, quote, his own, to his own place. That's weird. <laughs> uh, once the bottomless pit opens up, that devil who had been given apostolic power by Jesus and went to his own place, when that pit opens up, that demon is going to be able to get back out. And then, because he has the power of an apostle, he can call down fire from heaven. He has that godlike apostolic power. And furthermore, because he has the powers of an apostle, he's able to uh, give life to dead things. Again, that is godlike apostolic power. And there's only a handful of individuals in the Bible who have this power Moses, Elijah, Jesus, Joshua, Elisha, and the apostles. And by process of elimination, there is only one person who this could be. There's only one person who, who this could be. Out of all the people that have the power of an apostle and that spirit and power of Elijah, 
like I said, there's only a few of them in the Bible. Jesus, Moses, Elisha, you know, Joshua, Elijah, the apostles. By process of elimination, this guy could only be one person. And that's, uh, everything points to the fact that this false prophet is Judas Iscariot returned. Isn't that interesting? And once again, isn't it interesting that he's going to be the money man who will see to it that uh, no one can make any kind of financial transaction without his permission, having received the mark of the beast first, that 666, right? So if this is correct, consider what you have here. You have a prophet who directs people to worship a Christ. Just like John the Baptist was a prophet who directed worship towards, well, towards Jesus Christ over here, just like John the Baptist directed worship towards Jesus Christ, Judas Iscariot is going to be the false prophet like unto Elijah, if you will, who will direct worship towards the Antichrist. And I suspect that Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses, will still be alive when the bottomless pit opens. They'll be finishing up their ministry right around this time. Which means at the start of the Great Tribulation, there might just be an epic showdown. Moses versus Pharaoh, the Antichrist, and Elijah versus the prophet of Baal, the false prophet, Judas Iscariot. Back in the, <clears throat> back in the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah both used miracles, signs, and wonders to prove who the true God was. But back then, Moses and Elijah had the advantage because they were the ones that had the godlike power. But this time, they're going to be up against an ex-apostle who has the same godlike power that they have, and he's also able to exercise the satanic power that the Antichrist has. So the, the false prophet, this guy, he's loaded with all kinds of power. <laughs> he's got the power of God in one hand and the power of Satan in another. And uh, I suspect that the false prophet will challenge Moses and Elijah to a rematch. Look at Revelation 11, verse 7. It says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, okay, when they, Moses and Elijah, have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, according to the Bible, that could be the Antichrist, or, as we've seen, that could be the false prophet. Because they're both beasts, and they both ascend out of the bottomless pit by all indications. Okay, so it could be either one of them. The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, Moses and Elijah, and shall overcome them and kill them. Just as Elijah overcame the prophets of Baal and killed them, proving who the true God was, so the Antichrist and Judas will overcome Moses and Elijah and kill them. And if this scene involves a contest, I suspect that their victory will be used as proof that the Antichrist is God, just exactly as he had said when he had entered into the temple you know, probably just 72 hours prior. Or just within a few days ago when he answered in the temple and shows himself to be God. Moses and Elijah versus the Antichrist and Judas Iscariot have this showdown, and this time Judas Iscariot and the Antichrist win, and therefore that's supposed to be proof that, yeah, the Antichrist is God, right? And this could very well be the strong delusion spoken of in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, And then shall that wicked, okay, that's the Antichrist, the son of perdition, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They didn't receive the love of the truth in the church age. They didn't receive the love of the truth from the 144,000. They didn't receive the love of the truth from Moses and Elijah. So now the great tribulation is at hand. Verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. 
and that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They had all kinds of opportunity to repent, especially during the beginning of sorrows, but they rejected it. And so now the great tribulation comes and there's a famine for the word of God, and God sends them strong delusion. What kind of strong delusion would that be? Well, I reckon that the killing of Moses and Elijah could serve as strong delusion. For three and a half years, no enemy of Moses and Elijah could even get close enough to touch them. And uh, they, those two were invincible ministers for Jesus Christ. But if this new king and his prophet, this king who just rose from the dead, and his prophet can defeat Moses and Elijah, doesn't that mean that there's more power in them than there is in the name of Jesus? So wouldn't it stand to reason that everyone should worship this new risen king instead of this old risen king? Truthfully, the Antichrist and false prophet, you know, obviously they are not more powerful than Moses and Elijah or the name of Jesus, obviously. The only reason that the Antichrist and the false prophet are able to kill Moses and Elijah is because God had already planned for it to happen. He already said that they have a certain length, length of time that they're going to minister. God already knew what was going to happen. So, in other words, through this situation, when, the, when these two beasts kill Moses and Elijah, uh, through this situation, God is letting these people that are the world, he is letting the world think that the Antichrist is God. He's letting them think that. In other words, God is sending them strong delusion, which ultimately leads to everyone believing an idol, which is another word for a lie in the, throughout the Bible. The word lie and the word idol are synonymous in some places in the Bible. He sends them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Well, what's that? Revelation 13, 13. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. All right, which might be related to the defeat of Moses and Elijah, right? Let the true God bring down fire from heaven, and then Judas Iscariot is able to do it. <laughs> and uh, in verse 14, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had a sword, wound by a sword, and did live, and he had power to give life. Revelation 13, 15. Did you see that? The second beast that comes out of this bottomless pit, he has power to give life. That is apostolic, godlike power. The power to give life to things completely devoid of life is power that Satan does not have. Janus and Jambres, the two uh, uh, magicians of, the, of Pharaoh, could turn their wooden staves into snakes, but they could not turn dust into lice. Evidently, Satan does have the power to transform one form of life into another form of life. In other words, he could transform a plant into a snake, a form of uh, biological alchemy, if you will. But Satan does not evidently have the power to impute life to inanimate objects. He wasn't able to turn dust into lice, right? Uh, he can't give life to dust and rocks. God can give life to dust, as we know with Adam, right, and all of us. And God has that power and ability. And the reason why the false prophet can give life to an inanimate object is because he still has the godlike power that Jesus gave to him when he was in the person of Judas. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. <laughs> Romans 11, 29. All right, Revelation 13, 15, wrapping this up. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as was, would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Uh, the fact that idols can't talk and have no breath in them has always been an argument that God has used throughout the Bible to prove the stupidity of idolatry. For example, Jeremiah 10, 14, and 15 says, Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are vanity and the work of errors, and the time of their visitation they shall perish. All right? 
Habakkuk 2.18, this is what God says. What profiteth the graven image and the ma that the maker thereof hath graven it? The molten image and a teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols. In other words, speechless idols. Idols, these idols, they can't even talk, right? In verse 19, woe unto him that saith to the wood, awake, and to the dumb, the dumb stone, the speechless stone, arise, it shall teach. No, it won't. It can't even talk. It has no breath in it. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. <laughs> That's what the Lord is saying. There's no life in that thing. There's no breath in it. It can't even talk, right? Well, all of that is going to change thanks to a demon who obtained apostolic power a long time ago. Verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Well, that's a first. An image actually being able to move its mouth and speak and have breath. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Why? Because he has apostolic power. That the image of the beast should both speak, and now it's going to teach. Speak and, and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no, no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is three score, or I'm sorry, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Six, six, six. All right? So wrapping up, it seems to me that Satan's plan all along was to obtain God's power. Right? I mean, if of course Satan would want to try to get a hold of God's power. If Satan is going to someday defeat God, at least that's his ambition, if he's going to defeat God, he's going to need more power than he has currently. If Satan is going to defeat God, he needs God's power. He needs to be on somewhat of an even playing field, at least in his mind. And I think that Satan saw his chance when Jesus came to the earth. Obviously, Jesus wasn't fooled by, John the, uh, by, by Judas Iscariot. But nevertheless, Satan stuck his man in and among the apostles and achieved his goal when Jesus bestowed apostolic power upon a devil. Again, Jesus knew what he was doing. But I think that's what Satan was going for. That's exactly what he wanted. He wanted God to give godlike power to his own uh, demonic agent. And Satan is going to use that power to gain control over the whole earth during the Great Tribulation. You say, why hasn't he used that power already? Because uh, Judas Iscariot, the devil that went to his place, has been locked in the bottomless pit, <laughs> in chains under darkness, if you will. The reason why Satan hasn't done any of that up during the church age or any of this other time, the reason why Satan hasn't utilized those apostolic powers is because he can't. Judas Iscariot is locked in the bottomless pit. But when that bottomless pit is opened, then he can come out, and then he can start using those apostolic powers at Satan's bidding. As I said earlier on in these lessons, God has only entrusted his limitless power to a handful of individuals throughout history. And if you've ever wondered what would happen if that power fell into the wrong hands, well, now you know. <laughs> and the whole world is going to know probably before much longer, because we're getting close to the end. All right? So the spirit and power of Elijah was not a power unique to Elijah. It was the spirit and power of God that was Elijah and has been upon less than 20 men throughout all of history. The power to do godlike miracles and reality-bending uh, signs and wonders has only been on a handful of people. And as I've shown you in these lessons, it was on Moses, Joshua, Elijah. It was on Elisha after Elijah. And then, uh, obviously, Jesus had the power, and then he gave it to his 12 apostles. So that gives you Peter, Andrew, uh, we'll say James, Zebedee, John, Zebedee. 
Then you have Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James Alphaeus, and then you have Labaius, Thaddeus, 16, uh, Simon, the Canaanite, all right? So we've got 11, 11 apostles, and then uh, the apostle born out of due time, Paul, whoops, and uh, the last man that had this apostolic power, that had this godlike power to do reality-bending miracles. Like I said, out of all the people in the Bible, these are the only ones that have ever had that kind of power. The last one that has that power is number 18. I'm putting his, him as number 18. Judas Iscariot, or 666, right? 18 men in all of history had that power. So, I hope these lessons have been enlightening. I hope they've been interesting. I hope they've been informative. And I hope they've given you m even more of a thirst for the Word of God. God bless you, and we'll see you in a couple weeks.